On the Tamana podcast show today, we have Ben Robinson. Tell me your story. Tell oh. me Wagwan. I was about 15 when I first started uh, developing, uh, I'd say, a mild eating disorder. I was quite a chunky lad. I was at school in year 11, so there was a lot of pressure. So they started thinking about girlfriends, stuff like that. My mates were all slim, so I just went on a bit of a diet like everybody else does. And then it just all combined into one, so the growth spurt, the, the bit of a diet, and then um, the sport. Like, I just lost a big chunk of weight. All the comments started floating in like, oh, Ben, you're looking really well now, and you look better. You're going to keep that in your mind, aren't you? You're going to want to lose more weight to get more comments. So right. that was the drive. Um, and then it just suddenly became, within six months, it was a big obsession. And I went from three meals a day to two meals a day and then two meals a day to one meal a day and then one meal a day to no meals a day. I thought it was me at the time, but I started developing like a voice in my head. What was telling me when I woke up that I was fat and like, I need to not eat today to lose some weight. And then then I was um, excessively exercising as well. I did the Manchester 10K run off basically no food. I was just obsessed with losing weight. And the thing, what I knew there was something wrong with me, but I was too scared to ask anybody for help. But I kept it very secret. I used to wear baggy clothes to to not, for people not be able to see how skinny I was. I told a lot of lies, but that was the illness manipulating me. Yeah. To tell them lies. My dad had had enough, so we went to see a private paediatrician who within five minutes said, you've got anorexia. My heart rate was like 16 beats per minute. So I was pretty much on death's door. They told my mum and dad, you know, he might not make it through the night because his body's that weak. Because I was a stocky lad, it had fed on all my body fat and then it fed on all my muscle and then it began to feed on my organs. So I had all sorts of medical problems like hyperthermia, in the middle of summer like today, like hyperthermia because I had nothing to keep me warm. Nobody ever called me fat. Yeah. Nobody ever bullied me for the way I looked. It was kind of my own decision. It was just a gradual, um, a gradual a lifestyle choice which turned into like a bad obsession all i can explain anorexia is is like a good angel and a bad angel sat on your shoulders and the good angel is the real you and the bad angel is the anorexia anything that goes wrong especially personal wise yeah you blame yourself there's a lot of triggers to people who get in like the bereavement and mm. bullying and stuff like that. i've never had any of them I've never had a deprived childhood. Yeah. You know, I've had a really good upbringing. I've never had a family loss. Like, I, I just felt like giving up, so I hung myself. Right, okay. Um, you know, I went through about two months of a bad phase of self-harm, uh, attempting to kill myself, Yeah. Um, refusing medication, refusing food, stuff like that. So I wasn't, because of the mental state I was in, I wasn't able to make a rational decision. I couldn't make a decision for myself. Mm. Hence why I was detained under the mental health act. Which, How many times did you try? Um, oh, it was a good six, six to eight times. Um, I would just went through a phase where anything I could grab or hurt myself with, I would just go for. Somebody would sit with me within arm's reach at 24-7 because yeah. I was that high of a risk to myself. To me, an inpatient unit before I got it, before I went in, was some was a place where people were in straight jackets yeah. and screaming their heads at. Yeah. When I walked in there, it was like a youth centre. You know, there was like 18 teenagers, adolescents, yeah. who were all perfectly normal people. Just kind of lost. They the weren't way. weirdos. They weren't crazy. Yeah. They just had their own issues like I did. Yeah. And you know, and and I think that's the biggest uh, misconception about mental health units and mental yeah. health in itself. Like, it's not, upsetting, isn't it? Though? Yeah, because it's no different to somebody who gets cancer or has diabetes. Like, a mental health illness is an illness. There should be no um, stigma around this mental health. Like, hence why I do this kind of stuff. If I didn't go to hospital that day, I would have died because I would have carried on. And even when I was in hospital, I got told a night to live. That didn't think right. I need to eat now. I carried on not eating. I refused food, what they brought me and stuff like that. Nothing scares you. And that's the dangerous thing about mental health, you'll, especially self-harm and, and anorexia and stuff like that. Once the illness took hold of you, you'll just go and go until there's nowhere to go. People starve themselves to death. Is that a big part of it because you're in control of what you eat? Yeah, yeah. That's all it's about, especially. And that's why the self-harm came into it and, and depression and stuff like that is because when I went into that unit, all the control got took off me. 
you know, if I didn't eat, then I'd get put on nose feed. If I didn't, if I tried hurting myself to to regulate my emotions, I'd get stopped. You know, my exercise got cut down drastically. I was only allowed a 20 minute walk a day. The rest of the time I had to be sat down. So all, I've gone from exercising massive amounts, not eating, hurting myself, stuff like that, to a unit where I'm not allowed to do any of that. Hence why I had to give up. Fuck me. How did you cope? Give me some exa- Give me some examples. So if I got, yeah, I, did, I tended to do self-harm when I either ate or um, it was around guilt. To I thought, punish yourself. Yeah. I used to cut myself. I used to punch walls a lot. So I'd put a mattress up against my wall and punch that really hard. So it was punching something soft. I used to uh, get a red pen and slash my arms with a red pen because I used to like seeing blood. What was the reason for that? Uh, it was kind of like I was hurting the anorexia. Right, okay. So like it was causing pain to me, so I would cause pain to it because it was inside me. For people with anorexia who cut themselves because they think that calories will come out in the blood. That's how like, irrational it yeah. can go. Squeezing ice cubes. I don't know if you've ever done that, but it hurts. But yeah. it's safe. Squeezing an ice cube? Yeah. Yeah, get two ice cubes, squeeze them hard together. It's like the coldness is like painful to your hand, but it's right. just... Once you self-harm, it's a release. Yeah. You know, once you've cut yourself, it's like, for like, because your mind's focused on that pain. Yeah. So you don't have to think about the other stuff, what's going on in your head. Right. So it's like a short term. So you're redirecting the pain. Yeah. So you, it's like a short term fix, but then that's why it comes a problem because you, every time you get something in your head, you do it again. I had so much going for me. You know, I was a bright lad. Well, I am a bright lad. Like I had a good family, good set of friends who come and see me every day. And stuff like that but I just couldn't see any hope of me getting better I just felt like this was going to be in my life forever and when people were telling me you can get better I was like you're lying you you don't have to go through what I'm going through now I couldn't believe anybody and doctors who were making medical decisions for my best interest I couldn't trust they were telling me stuff what my illness was telling me was wrong but there was little things what nurses said or staff said you know what like triggers so like someone says if you finish a meal and someone says oh well done like you think instantly think oh my god i'm fat i'm fat because they're praising me for eating my food Uh, if someone says you look better well better to me is putting on weight and putting on weight means i'm gonna get fat right so oh your hair looks nice today oh if my hair looks nice that means there's nutrients in my body what's making my hair look nice so i must be getting fat the thought of eating one chip was the end of the world because I knew it had fat in it and I was obsessed with any foods with fat in I couldn't touch so you know before I went in hospital it was that obsessive I was walking around supermarkets for four four hours studying uh, labels on food packaging for four hours yeah my brain was in starvation mode so it became obsessed with anything to do with food so I'd sit at home and watch food programs all day uh, because it was the only way my because my brain was trying to get me to eat by watching food, it made me think, oh, I need to eat something. Obviously, because you're not eating, you're not feeling your brain to think properly. Think, exactly. So it's just the vicious circle. I got OCD, I got anxiety, depression, self-harm, just through the anorexia. And yeah. I think medications produce for a reason. Yeah. And it's to help, you know, and yeah. people think therapy... Especially if you're not eating and you're not getting that nutrients and stuff, you need to... That's the thing. Yeah. And when people are going through services, you know, they think people think that uh, therapy is the best option. But when your brain isn't fit enough to have therapy, it's uh, you're just wasting time. Whereas if you put on medication to, you know, balance the chemicals in your brain, then you can start therapy. But no, I, I would say I live a normal life. You know, I've got a good job. Uh, I eat normally. I think everybody has some kind of mental health problem yeah. at some stage in their life. You know, even loneliness, that's a mental health problem. Yeah. So, you know, sadness, that can lead to depression. Yeah. So I think everybody goes through it, but... The point at which the point at which it turned for me was, it was the last time I tried to uh, attempt to kill myself, and um, you know I was a mess. I had marks all over me. I'd, I'd bitten a hole out of my arm. What, just from biting your arm? Yeah, like there, I've got a big scar um, from I bit a chunk out of my arm to try and like yeah. bleed and stuff like that. So what was the reason for that? What was going on when you? Because what happened was I was put in a, a seclusion suite, so yeah. you put in like a a bare room with a mattress and stuff like that for your own safety. Yeah. And because I couldn't get my hands on anything to harm myself with because it's all clear in there and stuff like that, yeah. then I used my, like, my own teeth to hurt myself. People like 
squeak a bit squeamish when I say stuff like when I yeah. talk about that bit because they're like, oh, how could you bite a chunk out of your hand? But the point is, is that is how desperate I was to kill myself. Right. So that is what the illness will push you to do. They strip people's rooms into a bare room. But unless you pull the nails off and pull the teeth out, they'll still hurt themselves. Do you know? Uh, you will always find a way of hurting yourself. Like That's how desperate you were. But yeah, when it turned around, was at that point, and it was just something, it's what everybody had said to me before, but just this one person, this support worker, who said to me, look, Ben, you're in absolute mess. Like, look at the state. I had ligature marks over in my neck. I had cuts. He was like, you're 60. At this time, I was 16. Um, you know, you're going, you're supposed to be in college now. You're supposed to be out there with your friends going to college parties and stuff like that. And it was the same thing as everybody had told me in the past, what, who had worked with me and stuff like that. But just something clicked then with him. And I think it was because he was young. He was, you know, I think he was like early 20s. He was a lad. He had the same interest as me in sports and stuff like that. And I had a good connection with him. And it just clicked then. And I was like, you know what? Like, I can, I should be out there with my mates. And, you know, I should be living the life I deserve to live. And it was just like a battle every day. But then it just, I think I got a job in a mental health unit and I was doing what I'd always wanted to do. And that was like my therapy, helping people go through what I'd been through. Yeah. I started thinking, no, you know what? The more I fight this but this battle, the more rewards I'm getting from it. And then that's what pushed me and pushed me. And then now, like I said, um, but uh, then I wouldn't say I'm recovered. You know, because I still have the odd day where I wake up and think, oh, I could lose a bit of weight. But then straight away, the stronger Ben kicks in and says, you don't need to lose weight. You know, you're happy. It's, I don't know what to say, mate. It's like the <laughs> time I've been like golf spots. It's just like the, like the most inspirational stories I've heard in my yeah. life. Like, it's amazing, mate. Yeah, but the thing is, like, I'm just one person. There's so many people who have been through this and come out of it the other side. Hopefully by me doing this and this kind of stuff and people... I want people who have been who are at my stage but who don't talk about it to know that it's okay to talk about it. Have you always been open about it? I don't care if people have a problem with me having a mental health problem, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, don't get me wrong, when I was ill, I did. I was ashamed. Whereas now I just think there's no difference to me having a knee, well, having had, had a knee disorder to somebody who's had cancer. You know, there's no difference. It's an illness. Yeah. And, and yeah, it is, it is classed as a mental health illness, but... The mental health is the same as the physical health. You wouldn't break your leg and not go and get out, would you? That's the kind of message that I want to get out through doing all this is that, you know, you're not on your own. You know, there's people out there who, who can help you. And it, and sometimes it's people who aren't even medically trained. It's your best mate. My best mate's helped me through so much through my illness. You know, he, and, and that's just by him being by my side and saying, I'm not going to let it beat you. It's got that in it. Yeah, but... I'm sure if people are your best friends, they'll do the same. Yeah. So you, there is all you need to do is 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 take that first big step and and speak about it. For somebody um, who's got this going on in their headband and they're yeah. kind of listening to this now, what is that step that they can make? I, the thing is, it's a very hard step to make. I, I get that. I understand it because I've been there myself. Like, be, and you know, you've had mates around you. There's people yeah. that haven't got mates. So no. What can they do? I would say just whoever they feel most comfortable talking to, and if they've not got anybody who they feel comfortable talking to, a doctor, the GPs are a lot more trained in this kind of stuff than they were when I got first still. Um, uh, you can even there's there's crisis teams at A and E, and there's like you can there's beat beat eating disorders. I'm an ambassador for that charity. What's it called again? It's called Beat B E A T. Have they got a website? Yeah, it's the UK's biggest eating disorder charity. Okay, and uh. Their services are fantastic. So, when was the point when you thought to yourself, "Oh, you know what? I'm actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna beat this motherfucker." Yeah, I'd say it was two years ago. Working, working at the unit as a support worker, seeing people not go through anorexia but other mental health problems, and like I was helping them on a day to day basis. I met new people who didn't judge me or didn't know me for my past. They knew me as me. And just stuff like that. And uh, like I said, I started introducing sport back into my life, started going out with my mates again. Because um, all my social life stopped when I was when I was poorly. The, the bully, yeah. you know, we're going to call him the chimp, yeah. comes into your head every now and then. How do you, how do you manage him? Um, I just know that he's lying to me. All it's ever done is lied to me since day one. 
you know, it said I'd look better if I lost weight. I didn't look better. I looked like a skeleton. You know, it said I'd be much happier. I got depression. Mm. You know, it said I'd, I'd get a girlfriend. They didn't bring me a girlfriend, anorexia. So I just know everything it says to me is a lie. So even though it's there, yeah. I don't, I can't just like bat it off. But I just yeah. have to think, right, okay, it's saying this to me. I'm going to eat my breakfast and go yeah. to the gym, take my mind off it. Yeah. I'm going to go out with my friends now and I'll take my mind off yeah. it. So where can people find you then if they want to go and watch your journey, see your journey? Yeah. Are, you, are you on Instagram, Twitter, yeah, I'm Facebook? On, what, what have you got? I'm on Facebook. My page is, it's just Ben Robinson, MH, which means mental health. Yeah. Um, Instagrams, I've two accounts. I've got Ben Robbo 24 and Ben Robbo 17. Yeah. Ben, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you on. very much for really, having me. Really, really cool, mate. Thank you. Um, like I said, if anybody wants to go and find Ben, Go and DM him if you've got any questions yeah, yeah, and stuff like that. Yeah. Thanks very much, mate. You're welcome. It's okay not to be okay.